So there are a few cool things to talk about uh, regarding the science behind the air cannon. And I'm going to start off by talking about how you can use compressed gas to store energy and then how we can transmit the uh, force to the projectile using the pressure which goes to an acceleration then a velocity and then once we have that velocity coming out of the barrel of the cannon uh, we're going to go into projectile motion and then I'm going to talk about how drag affects the path of the projectile through the air and using using all this stuff we can make some predictions and I'm going to compare those predictions to our actual cannon results. So if we think about it it's pretty cool that we can store energy using the air which is just you know around us all the time <laughs> and and by shoving so much of it in this container that it all gets the, the, the molecules really don't want to be next to each other so they fight against it and, and you can use that 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 tendency to, to want to be further apart to store energy just like a spring when you compress a spring and the spring wants to naturally be further apart you can store energy that way uh, but it turns out for the weight storing uh, energy as compressed gas isn't very good compared to like gasoline or lithium ion batteries or other things like that. It turns out a gasoline may be like a thousand times better at storing the energy for the weight. So that's that's why you wouldn't see compressed air systems on like airplanes or cars or other things where you need lightweight systems. But uh, it does have the advantage of being able to cheaply produce a lot of power uh, and by that I mean energy per unit time. So it can you can send a lot of energy out of an air tank very quickly, and that's what we're doing with the air cannon. And they use that sort of a system at a couple of theme parks for accelerating roller coasters. It's pretty neat. There's one in New Jersey that goes 128 miles an hour powered by this compressed gas system. And also for uh, pneumatic hand tools, where like you might have an impact wrench at like a car auto body shop or something like that they're often more powerful than the electric counterparts because the air compressor spends a, a while charging the tank with energy and often at the at the limit to the electrical systems in the place so it might be running at 15 amps where the the circuit breaker would trip right above that and it's storing energy storing energy and then you can use all of that energy in a very short amount of time with the air uh, which you wouldn't be able to do with the electrical systems there. It's pretty cool. All right, going back to the whiteboard here. So as we know, pr force equals pressure times area, and that makes sense because if we think about, here, here's an example. If, if, there's, if you're at a, an aquarium and there's this big glass window and there's a tiny hole in the, in, in the window and water is like pouring out of the tiny hole, you might imagine that you would be able to stop that flow of water by pushing your finger in the hole like really hard. But if you, if you imagine the whole wall, the whole aquarium wall uh, came loose and you had to support uh, the entire glass surface, you probably would get flattened. <laughs> and uh, the difference in those two cases, the, if you look at it, the pressure is the same in both cases. But the area is increased many times when the whole wall, when you're supporting the whole wall and not just the tiny hole. And that's what we see here. The force is dependent on the pressure and the cross-sectional area and we can relate this to our cannon in that the pressure is what the pressure is behind the projectile and the area is a cross-sectional area of the barrel. I'm going to assume in this uh, calculation here that the pressure behind the projectile is the same as the pressure in the tank but that probably isn't the case because there are probably some fluid losses going through the valve and through other joints and whatnot but here I'm going to make that assumption. So uh, if we look at the other side of the uh, of, at the reaction force on, from the projectile side, we see this equation here, Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. It, this, if we combine these two equations, we can find the acceleration of our projectile. I'm going to set the forces equal to one another and out pops acceleration equals pressure times area over mass. Sweet. So I'm going to take that, integrate that, and I get velocity equals pressure times area over mass times time. So as time increases, the velocity increases. That makes sense because the velocity is increasing as it goes through the barrel and time's going on and on. And in integrate, that, oh, integrate that one more time and I get di the distance traveled equals one half pressure times area over mass times time squared. That's an interesting result there. In both of these cases, there would be constants of integration that pop out but I'm setting them equal to zero because 
This one would be the initial velocity, which I'm starting at rest, so that drops out. This would be the initial distance traveled, and I'm saying I'm starting at distance zero, so that goes to zero as well. I can take this equation here and this equation uh, and solve for t here, pop the t into there, and I get this equation, velocity as a function of the parameters of the system, which are, is the distance, which is the length of the barrel, the pressure, the cross-sectional area of the barrel, and the mass of the projectile. And if we look at that, that's pretty interesting. As the mass increases, the velocity at the end of the, at the, end of the barrel decreases. That makes sense because you have to accelerate a heavier object, which takes more energy. If we look at the other things, the longer barrel increases the velocity, makes sense. Higher pressure and larger area is interesting, increases the in velocity. So now our projectile comes shooting out of the barrel of the cannon. What is the motion going to look like through the air? Well, to do that, I'm going to break this up into the, two, the motion in two dimensions, the y dimension and the x dimension. Much like you can have an Etch-a-Sketch and you have two knobs, one that controls the motion in the vertical direction, one that controls the motion in the horizontal direction. I'm going to do the same here. We look at a free body diagram of our projectile, and the only force on it here is that of gravity. I'm going to ignore drag in this first example. We take Newton's second law and we look at the force in each direction, and the force in x is zero because the only force is straight down, and the force in y is negative mg, that of gravity. We can find the acceleration then using the second law. Acceleration x direction zero, y direction negative g. From the acceleration we can integrate with respect to time to get the velocity. This one d is dependent on time, x direction is a constant. We integrate one more time to get the positional data for x and for y, both with respect to time. If we solve for time here and then plug that time in for the time over here, we can isolate the equation to be that of just x, to be just dependent on x and y. And we're going to get some equation which ends up looking like this. y equals some constant times x squared plus some constant times x plus another constant. And we can recognize this as being the equation of a parabola. And that's a lot what the motion looks like, so we, we know we might be on the right path. So what happens when you add in drag? So drag is pretty interesting. Uh, Here's our free body diagram of the object flying through the air with drag. The drag, the force of drag acts in the opposite direction as the velocity, and the force of drag is equal to this equation, or this is how we approximate it. One half rho, this is the density of the fluid, times v squared, velocity of the object through the fluid, times the coefficient of drag, which is found experimentally, times the area, the cross-sectional area, um, that's perpendicular to the velocity that you're traveling in. For a sphere, the coefficient of drag is around 0.5, and that's the same as for a lot of objects. It always tends to be around 0.5, unless it's a really odd object. If we look at the Newton's second law, we can tell here force equals mass times acceleration. What's interesting about this is that the force doesn't change with the mass of the object. If it's a lot heavier of an object, um, as long as the shape doesn't change and the and the air, you know the cross-sectional area change, it's going to be the same force. So if we have a more massive object and the same force, that means the acceleration goes down. And this acceleration that we're talking about is in the negative direction. So it slows down less when you have a heavier object. That's cool. That makes sense because if we think of like a feather falling versus a a lead feather, <laughs> that we know that the lead feather is probably going to fall a lot faster than the uh, the regular feather. Be and that's because the mass of the lead feather is higher. It means that the uh, deceleration pushing back up, you know, from the falling feather is going to be a lot less. Here's, here's a couple of graphs of levels of drag. We, if this, is, this black line here is the par parabolic solution that we just talked about earlier. Um, if we include drag, it could be a, a lot less or it could be very similar. It depends on all of these factors, you know, so, but it's possible that the parabolic solution closely approximates the actual solution, but there is a chance that it could be a lot different. Is drag important? It's hard to say. I, there's no rule of thumb that I know of, but it, when compare, comparing two things, you can use this equation to say, well, that one's going to be a lot more affected by drag than this other one, and by this amount. 
Unfortunately, this equation is really hard to solve or perhaps impossible because of the v squared term and it's necessary to, to solve it through iteration. And that's what the script does, it's lower down on the page. So you have an air cannon and you want to get maximum range out of it. What angle do you point it at to get that maximum range? Well, it's 45 degrees for the no drag case, but when you include drag, that angle goes down. So if we lower the angle we shot the cannons at from 45 degrees to around 35 degrees, we might have netted an additional 10% in terms of distance. Not too much, but it's probably noticeable. So how do our equations stack up when we actually fire the cannon? Let's check it out. We predicted using our velocity equation that I just went over a little earlier. I plug in the mass of the potato, the pressure, the length of barrel, cross-sectional area, all those parameters, and now it pops 100, uh, sorry, 406 meters per second. That's a little fast. Uh, the speed of sound is 340 meters per second, so we're expecting like a sonic boom coming off of this cannon, and uh, I think that's a little unrealistic. Uh, seeing as though we're using air to propel the potato, I don't think it's going to happen. So when we actually measured the velocity, we got 118 meters per second. So what caused the error here? What, what's going wrong? Well, I don't think we included enough uh, parameters in terms of air resistance of the fluid flowing through the pipe, through the valve, the time the valve takes to open. There's a lot more going on than we, uh, we expected just looking at the forces and the pressure. Um, those, those, the, the, when you have high speed air going through pipes, the losses are going to be on the order of the velocity squared. So although low flow might not see the effects, this fast flow here, 118 meters per second, is really fast. We're going to get some significant uh, drag through the pipe and through the valve, and that's going to cause a pressure drop so that the, the potato actually sees a lower pressure relative to the outside than if there was no drag and that's what we experienced here and that's what but I, I at least attribute to the air could be something else but that's what I'm thinking so in terms of distance how do we do our prediction uh, with the little calculator the iterative drag calculator predicts 192 meters in actuality it went around 200 so that's really close I'd say this is a success success yes and uh, although the parabolic equation uh, says that we should get around 1400. That's seven times what we actually got. So in this case, drag was a really big factor. And that makes sense because of the really high speeds. The high speeds lead to high f forces of drag because that causes velocity squared again. So all in all, we have some success, some failure. At the same time, we learned something from it. So I think it's all good. I'd be excited to hear about your results if you have a cannon like this in the forums. I want to know speed, distance, and then also the attributes to your canon so that uh, we can look at how the, the equations hold up and if you have any other ideas about what we can include in terms of attributing the error to uh, or making the equations better. I'd like to hear about it. See ya.